a man with no identity. He gave different names and stories to everyone he met, popping in and out of cities, never leaving a trace, until one day he left the biggest clue of all, an abandoned little girl left at a trailer park. Years later, police would learn that his crimes spanned the country and the decades. This week's episode is Terry Rasmussen, the Chameleon Killer. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister I went to a wedding this weekend. Oh, yeah? How was it? It was so fun. And we got to dance in a circle while everyone lifted the bride and groom on chairs. Jewish wedding. Yes, it was magical. That is a Jewish wedding. Well, everybody was so happy and it was so joyful. Well, and that's just a wedding. That's true. But in <laughs> this case, for the like, not always. That's true. But like the, that particular moment was, uh, Jill Nastasia on Facebook was uh-huh. like, it's like the true meaning of like, I got your back when the DJ said, okay, come out and help. And just everyone comes out and pitches in. And yep. it's very, it was very lovely. My best friend in high school was Jewish and she always said the most fun weddings were Jewish weddings. I've never been to a Jewish wedding. It was wonderful. Very nice. Overall, uh, would recommend going go to any wedding and dancing so hard that your friend splits his pants. That I have seen. <laughs> I, uh, what did I do this weekend? We took Ella to uh, an indoor playground. She's, we like the indoor playground. Well, yeah, you have to because it's it is, a thousand degrees. Yes. We're, we don't want to put her in danger yeah. by having her play in an outdoor playground. It is outrageously hot. Got, uh, one of our dogs, some CBD pills. Wait, you can give dogs CBD? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. What? You can give yeah. anybody CBD. Yeah, you can actually. What does it do to the dog? It just chills her out. Cause she's, uh, terrified of thunderstorms oh, okay. so we're getting her year- used to it so then when a thunderstorm comes we can give them to her and she'll be okay it's pretty soon she's gonna be wanting it to be thunderstorms all the time it's not like i mean i take cbd every night it's oh, not like it just uh, makes you feel good it just i wouldn't say it makes you feel good it just like makes you feel relaxed nice. i mean good but like it's not weed like no. if you smoke weed and you get giddy and high. And no, it's I figured just it like, just makes you like chill. Yeah. Like, yeah. It just takes the, not even like that. It just takes the edge off kind of. Interesting. Like you're not like, Hey man, like it, that at all. Or <laughs> Unless you're like, like that. that anyway. Yeah. I suppose <laughs> so. But yeah, no, it just like takes the edge off. It also helps with like, uh, eczema, Tommy's eczema. I, I was eczema. actually going to tell you, you should take it because of your have gluten so much, intolerant eczema. I have so much eczema. His cleared up night and day wow. before he started taking it. All right. I got to try it. Helps with anxiety, insomnia, um, just general anything. You know, helps with my insomnia. Triple D I was watching that last night. Oh, right diners, drive-ins and dives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which one was it? Where was he? Uh, he was in new Orleans. Oh, that's a good one. Man, shrimp Creole. It looks so good. Yeah. That's the only thing is in you dream about, I was like dreaming about shrimp and rice and sandwiches. Oh man, but, man. I love a good dream about a sandwich. <laughs> It's true. For all, I dreamt about blueberry pancakes Saturday night Ooh. into Sunday, and I woke up and said, I have to have blueberry pancakes. Did you wake up the next day and say, I have to have a sandwich? <laughs> the, today. today? Yeah, I was actually very disappointed at my lunch. It was good. It's what I usually have, chicken and rice and beans and stuff, but... It yeah. wasn't a sandwich. This isn't like a grinder. This isn't like a. <laughs> this isn't a New York, New New Orleans Creole sandwich. Guy's not gonna take a bite and be like, "Oh, it's dynamite." I mean, it's. Edible. Here's my one thing about a lot of the places that he goes to, and this isn't anything to do with him. It's uh-huh. to do with the places. I don't like a burger or a sandwich that is so piled high and thick that. It's not unwieldy. You can't eat that. Yeah. It's just shit's falling out the side. You're gonna have to use a fork and knife. You're you it's you're gonna have to just like deconstruct it to even be able to deal with it. And then it's like kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah, and then you're like you're bowl. not getting all of it in exactly. If I wanted a bowl, I'd just get a bowl. Triple D Nation. He goes back and vis- revisits places that mm-hmm. he's already gone to, which is such a great idea to reuse content. But yeah, <laughs> it's also fascinating. But there's a burger place on there that makes these burgers that are like the size of a baby's head. Like yeah. it's just. 
huge. But they wrap it up in what they call a burger diaper. And much like a Chipotle burrito where you're not supposed to unfurl the full burrito, yes, you're supposed yes. to just peel or a Jimmy John sandwich, mm-hmm. you're supposed to or a Jimmy John's unwitch, you're supposed to peel it back. So this was a burger diaper that they What's the diaper? A bun? It's, no, it's a wrap. Oh, you mean it's wrapped in paper? Yeah, they paper so it wrap it like a baby diaper. That that is helpful. It was genius. I think uh, the kudos to those people. Yeah, there was no way you were going to. I also us. have never been able to master the Jimmy John's Unwitch. I love a Jimmy John's. Oh, I unwitch. love the Unwitch. I cannot figure out how it. to get that thing back. I always eat like ten percent paper, but I get yeah. it. It doesn't fall apart. Unwitch is my preferred go to at Jimmy John's. In fact, I don't know if I've ever had an actual sandwich at Jimmy John's. Why are we talking about sandwiches and not about Billy Jensen? <laughs> I bet he likes a good We're like, sandwich. what's a fun thing that we just did? Oh, I just like, went to a wedding and had a sandwich. Like, you said what we did on the weekend. That's true. Technically we, true. We met and interviewed Billy Jensen on Thursday. That's right. Which in college was the weekend. That was the That's start true. of the weekend. Man, yeah, but back in the day. I am not in college anymore. No, me neither. But yeah. yeah, we got to meet and interview and hang out with Billy Jensen and that a was bunch of part. listeners. And it was super fun. Also, that bookstore in Terrabang Books... Super badass bookstore. It's so nice. There are so many puzzles. We put our things on. I'm going on. to go back for some Christmas gifts. And there's a bunch of uh, kids books. Yes, they have um, uh, kids story time twice a week. Too. Oh, very nice. And all those like stationary things. Anyway, it was a very lovely venue. Billy Jensen was very lovely. He was so nice. Tom, who was the manager. Yes, great. Tom was very nice. And uh, we got to take a fun picture. And Tommy. Tommy. Tommy holding up his phone in the photo <laughs> with that shit eating grin on his face. They said, everyone hold up your books. Everyone in that audience, every, every everybody person. had a copy of that book, except my husband, who happened to be front and center. <laughs> like one person over from Billy Jensen. And he just held up his phone with and this giant grin. grin on his face. <laughs> but he also was holding it. With both hands. Like a book. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like he was just like holding it up. No, he was presenting it. Yes, for the photo. yes, yes. Man, I love it was that. Super picture. fun. Gr- had some great questions, got mm-hmm. some great answers. We are going to be posting that audio probably within the week. Yes. We're waiting on a couple things. And then if you're one of our Patreons in the Ruling the Airwaves tiers, we are going to post that on Patreon. The video. The video. Yes, the video. So. What a fun Some time. Fun stuff. It was super fun and we couldn't have done it without all the recommendations we got from the, on the yeah. Dallas Murderinos page from we have a lot of crossover listeners who would have thought yeah, right. between my favorite murder and us. And a lot of you guys recommended us to Billy to have us interview him. And that's what made it happen. So thank you so much to you guys. Seriously. And to everyone that came out and gave us gifts. That was so nice. I was like Christmas. Oh, man. Beyonce candle. We got a... The Beyonce candle, my sloth coin purse. Yes, I got a coin purse as well. And a Homemade candle. wine. Man, a jug of wine. Jug of wine. It's a big old... It was a huge mason when jar you leave of wine. Here, I'm going to hit that. Wine. You're gonna hit the wine. I think so. I don't have CBD oil, so I gotta do something. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, it was super fun, and we're super honored. And one of the cases Billy talks about in his book that we were interviewing him about, Chase Darkness with Me, is the topic we're doing today. Yes, I listened to the audiobook three times in a row. Yes, so Billy Jensen's it's a great book. Everyone should go out and pick out oh, a copy. Absolutely, very good. Kindle, Audible, actual book. I have all three. I have all three as well. <laughs> But it's good because the Kindle I can search. The book is a ni- I like to read a solid book. Yeah. And the Audible I can listen to at any time. I actually listen to, yeah, let's do it three and almost a half times. I love Kindle because I like to highlight things. Yes. And, and then and I, I like, sh- I like to read with the lights off at night. So it's hard for me to read an actual book, but True. I do have an actual book that he signed. So, so nice. But yeah, so that, for that listening to it over and over again, this case really got both, you know, and Christy was reading the book over and over and we got this like, you can't, it, the thought of this case is so mind blowing and it's almost confusing of how much stuff that's happened. I don't happened. know about almost. I think okay. it is it confusing. It is confusing. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it starts back in the forties and it ends up until this summer pretty much. Right. And it's. Very, There's a lot of twists and turns. When I say it's like a Tarantino movie, something's going on, but meanwhile, something else is going yeah. on. So we're going to try to make sure we cover it in a nice, chronological, organized order. Yes. And hopefully stop each other if we uh, say anything that's uh, you know out of order or confusing. And Billy calls this guy, in his opinion, the worst serial killer that the world has ever seen. Yes. So that's just... 
setting it up for <laughs> for what's about for to, what's about to happen. Pretty bad stuff. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Terry Peter Rasmussen was born in 1943 in Denver, Colorado. By 1954, he and his family had moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where he attended Whittier Elementary School until 1958. He then attended North Park High School, but dropped out after his sophomore year. Not long after leaving high school, Terry made the decision to enlist in the U.S. Navy, where he served as an electrician on bases across the United States and even Okinawa. Upon being discharged in 1967, Rasmussen moved to Hawaii, where he worked at a shoe shop owned by his parents. So he's kind of making his way, meandering through. Yes, he is making his way and meandering through. Not really settling down, putting roots anywhere. He's sort of a nomad at this point. At this point, he is. It was in Hawaii that he also met his first wife. And on July 20th, 1968, they were married. The following year, Terry and his new bride moved back to Phoenix, where the first of his children, twin daughters, were born. Never one to stay in one place for too long, Terry packed up his family and in 1970 moved them to Redwood City, California. He continued to work as an electrician, finding work in Palo Alto. Later that same year, his family grew in size once again with the birth of his son. Over the next two years, Terry and his wife had two more children, another boy and girl. Shortly after giving birth to their fourth child, Terry's wife made the decision to leave him, and in 1972, packed up her bags, taking all four children with her. The couple eventually reconciled, but it didn't last for long. Sometime between 73 and 74, Terry and his first wife split for good. And sometime between things like that, you get a lot in this case because there are so few actual legitimate proof of him existing in a lot of places. There's just some timelines that come from interviews or from what police could piece together. Not a lot was known about his life at this point. No, not really. But again, I mean, that could be said for a lot of people back then. If you're not doing anything wrong. True. Who did I talk to? Someone said, oh, yeah, it was a friend of mine from when I first moved to Dallas. And he said his dad is in his 80s. And he said he had every tax return that he ever filed. Wow. He had every, think about being 80 some years old. I think that's generational. That's boxes and filing cabinets full. Yeah. I mean, you probably start filing taxes when you're 18. Maybe. I don't think I did. Cause if you're still, if you're in college and on your parents' insurance and stuff, I didn't have a job. Oh. So yeah, 18 to early 20s. Yeah. So 60 60 to 70, 60, 65 tax returns. Yeah. Plus all the documents. Why did he think he need them in the event he was ever audited? It doesn't matter if you're audited. They only, I think they go back five years and then they can go back further beyond that. But just think about that. When you're 80, would you remember where you worked when you were 24? Hell no. He could look it up. I don't remember where I worked now when I was 24. Yeah, me neither. I think it's C-Dog. That's just a fair guess. (laughs) 24. Well, 24, I just graduated college. Same. Yeah. So yeah, I do know where I was working. Yeah. But yeah, man, you think about, I sound like I'm, uh, I am telling the benefits of being a hoarder. There are not benefits. <laughs> it's very bad. But yeah, I, I, I think some people like to hold on to that stuff, but I also think it's like a generational thing. That's true. Because I, um, throw everything in the trash. I was going to say, I just pile stuff up and ignore it. So it's sort of the same. And then eventually Tommy just... will take stuff and shred it. Oh, that's fine. I'm like, eh. I'll just throw all these credit card applications in the trash. <laughs> somebody, if somebody wants to go to the trash and open them in my name, joke's on them. Cause... I do like to pour gross stuff on them, though, so that way. Oh, I'll case. rip them in half sometimes. Yeah, that's good. But I also will throw, like, check stubs in the trash. Just throw anything out. I don't throw anything with my... <sighs> I shouldn't be saying all this. Somebody can come over to my trash and <laughs> go through it. I never throw anything that has my social security or any yeah. kind of really like incriminating information yeah. on it. I don't think your We're, social security number is incriminating. Didn't that guy that had that program that he was like, I'm so confident <laughs> yes. your identity won't life be lock. stolen. Here's my social security number. And then that idiot's identity got stolen. Yeah. <laughs> Lifelock unwound it, but to the extent that they can't prevent it, really, he's like, it won't be that, that backfired. Bad. Yeah, not great. <laughs> Everyone put in- was like, Steve, we really don't think this is a good idea. No, I'm putting it on a, I'm putting it on a bus. I'm he putting put it on, on a the, billboard. You put it on the side of trucks. I know. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Moron. <laughs> that's a, that's a case of you get what you're asking yeah, for. Yeah. Somebody was like, 
I don't even really care about stealing this guy's identity, but I just want to shut his smug ass up <laughs> exactly. prove that I can. You know what? I don't want to see those billboards no more. Right? Well, his ex-wife and children moved back to Phoenix after they split. And during Christmas of 1974, Terry paid them an unexpected visit. Terry told them he was now living in an apartment in Ingleside, Texas. He also had a female companion with him that trip. Terry's ex-wife and four children would later tell authorities they had no idea who the woman was. That would be the last time they would ever see Terry Rasmussen. Not long after, his killing spree across America would begin. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. Well, this is a person, like we said, that starts early and it's going to go on and on and on. Yeah. Marley's Elizabeth Honeychurch was born in 1954 in Connecticut. The second oldest of five children, she came from a large family. But in 1961, her parents divorced and her mother moved to California with her three youngest siblings. Marlise and her older sister decided to stay behind to live with their father. In 1970, at 15 years old, Marlise decided to leave Connecticut and move out to California to be with her mother. Wanting a fresh start, she enrolled in Artesia High School in Lakewood, California, and started using her mother's last name, Salomon. It was here Marlise also met and fell in love with her boyfriend, whom she would marry just a year later, on June 12, 1971, at a ceremony in Las Vegas. Seven months later, on December 6, the couple would welcome their first daughter into the world, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn. Very pretty name. Yes. Uh, Marie is like a long-term family name for us. We got a lot of aunts and grandmas and everybody with Marie as a middle name. Good friend Amanda Austin, owner of Dallas Comedy House. Love. It's a running bit with her that my middle name is Marie. Christy Marie. It is not Marie. No. It does start with an M. Yes. But every she, she likes to think anyone, any female that has the middle initial M, it's automatically Marie. Christy Marie. She is very, she is well aware. I've known her for 12 years and my middle name is Marie. I but love she that. loves to call me Christy Marie. It's a good way. It's a good, like, get the hell over here phrase. Like, Christy Marie, get over here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know your middle name. I was trying it's, to think of what your middle name. It's not Marie. It's not Marie. No. No. It's Chester. <laughs> Yes, Heather Chester McKinney. It was Chesterfield, but I changed it. I shortened it. <laughs> ah, Convenience. I think you should have kept the field. <laughs> oh, no. oh, man, I can't go back now. <laughs> they freeze you out when you change your middle name. Oh, no. No takesies, backsies. That's mm. the law. It's in the code. <laughs> Over the next few years, Marlise and her family lived in various cities around California and even moved back to Stanford, Connecticut to live with her father for a bit before eventually landing in Fall River, Massachusetts, in February of 1973. Marlise's husband was in the Navy, and he was stationed at a nearby base. The once happy couple had been experiencing marital problems, and in July decided to separate, with Marlise's husband and young daughter moving back to California. Not long after, Marlise moved too in order to fight for custody of Marie. Unable to reconcile their differences, the couple divorced in 1974, with Marlise being awarded full custody. A few months later, in Los Angeles, Marlise married her second husband. Not long after, she welcomed her second daughter into the world, Sarah. So at this point now, she has two kids. And, uh, has and, had, is, on, and is on her second husband. Correct. But she, so the first, Marie is about, what did we say, three? When she was born, December 6, 1971, and this is... 1974. So she's about three. And sure. then she just had, so and she has an infant newborn. and a three, yes. three-year-old. Sadly, this marriage was also not meant to last, and the couple divorced. It was then, in 1978, that Marlise began dating Terry Rasmussen. Thinking she had finally found the one, Marlise and her daughters took her new boyfriend to visit her mother in the small L.A. area town known as La Puente, California. This would be the first and only time Marlise's family would have any contact with Terry Rasmussen. Unfortunately, during the visit, Marlise and her family got into a fight. Upset, Marlise put her daughters in the car and took off from her mom's house, Terry by her side. That would be the last time anyone in her family would see her or her daughters alive again. And so at that point, the daughter was 70, like four and seven, four and two, four, or seven and four. Yeah. Because 1974, yeah, three. So yeah, seven and three. Yeah. Yes. And they're just gone. Can you imagine that family just 
they don't. I mean, back then, how? Well, you, they don't know that anything's happened. Well, at this the same. Point. They're just gone. But the, you, you think? Well, I hope she calls because you don't know where she's moving to. You don't know how to get a hold of her. No one had cell phones. Yeah, no cell phones, no internets. Man. Just three years later, in 1981, a man named Bob Evans, who bore a striking resemblance to Terry Rasmussen, began dating 23-year-old single mom Denise Bowden in New Hampshire. Denise had a six-month-old daughter named Dawn. So at this point, he's gone through his first family he left behind, and now he's somehow disappeared with the second family, with the Honey Churches, Mm -hmm. and now he's moved on, changed his name from Terry Rasmussen to Bob Evans, and is now cozied up to Denise with her six-month-old daughter. Correct. It's helpful for me to recap. (laughs) (laughs) That same year, Denise, her daughter, and Bob spent Thanksgiving with Denise's family. Over the holiday, Bob told the family that he and Denise owed money to some shady characters, and that in order for them to stay safe, they would need to take little Dawn and flee town. And with no further explanation to her family, they did just that. That is a... If you are going to run off with someone, maybe don't want anyone to come looking for her. I mean, that's a pretty... Say you're dealing with some shady characters. Well, saying if you look for us, you will put her in danger is, you know, that's how he's tricking the family. You're manipulating. Yeah, he's manipulating his family. Despite not hearing from their daughter, the Bowdens assumed that Denise and the baby were safe out of town with Bob. But that was only partially true. In 1985... The residents of Holiday Host Trailer Park in Scotts Valley, a small town near Santa Cruz, California, were greeted by a new neighbor. He introduced himself as Gordon Jensen and introduced a small girl with him as his five-year-old daughter named Lisa. Was this Gordon Jensen or was it Terry Rasmussen? Neighbors felt sorry for the pair as Gordon explained Lisa's mom's absence with various tragic stories. According to Billy Jensen's book, Chase Darkness With Me, At various times, Gordon would explain that Lisa lost her mom, a woman named Denise Laporte, in a robbery gone wrong or a car crash, changing details depending on with whom he spoke. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the country, in New Hampshire, two hunters in a wooded area made a heinous discovery. It was early November 1985 when a hunter near Bear Brook State Park near Allenstown, New Hampshire, came across a 55-gallon drum tipped on its side near a burned-down convenience store. The man approached the barrel and first saw a bit of a plastic bag sticking out. Then he saw a human skull. Not what you expect when you're in the forest. First of all, there shouldn't be a barrel out there. I'll tell you what. If you ever come across a 55-gallon drum in the forest... Ain't nothing good coming out of that. Ain't nothing good coming out of that. Mm -mm. I call the police. Don't touch it. Immediately. Don't touch it. Immediately. Or if you find one in your crawl space. No. Or under your house, which is another story that Billy talks about in his book. That book... That book, that story in that book fucked me up. The Howard Elkins. Thousand Faces? Yeah, the Howard Elkins. The, yeah. Yeah. God, read Billy Jensen's book. <laughs> it's really good. This is not sponsored by Billy Jensen. <laughs> it's just in my brain because I only <laughs> listen to it over and over. When authorities opened the barrels, they found the remains of a woman and a small child, somewhere between the ages of five and ten years old. The injuries were violent. Both had been subjected to blunt force trauma to the head the backs of the skulls having been crushed in with what looked to be a brick, and both were badly decomposed. Unfortunately, DNA testing at the time was impossible, so the identities of the victims would remain a mystery for a few more decades. That is a grisly discovery. Yes. And and very confusing one at that. That's one of those that you're just like, where do we even start? And why don't we have missing persons? If there is a woman and a child, that yeah. surely that would have been on our radar. That would be some red flags that we would have heard. You know, that as law enforcement, you think that obviously that would have been Man, something it must reported. Have been super tough to be in law enforcement before DNA or and before like databases or email. Yeah. Or, you know, you could really the criminals had the upper hand as long as they yes. had a car, they could go. That's why I've, I always say like back in Jack the Ripper times or even in the 20s, 30s, 40s, Up you to just the kill somebody in the street. And just walk away and nobody's gonna say they anything. couldn't catch you or like yeah. here you just you could dump someone somewhere and if you really didn't leave fingerprints and you weren't in a system somewhere they wouldn't yeah. know and that's one thing billy talks about in the book is 
people always say, well, why don't we have serial killers like we did back in the day, like Bundy and Gacy and everything? Well, it's because thankfully technology and science mm-hmm. has caught up. And before they can get those kind of numbers, somebody swoops in and shuts it down. Yeah. And there's cameras in the area, too. So they, you know, when, when that thing happened on Greenville Avenue in Dallas, there was a case that just happened. The police actively put out a request and said, please submit your ring videotapes, like your camera doorbell video camera footage. What happened? Us. The young woman who was going to her birthday party and she was abducted by a gentleman, who an asshole. She was abducted by this asshole at gunpoint. He forced her to drive around to some ATMs and then he shot her mm-hmm. and then put her body in her car and set her car on oh, fire. Oh, yes. The one, the woman that was yes. just found he burned left out in the car. Fingerprints in the car. So they were able to find him. But Laura Goff came up to me. Laura Goff's a phenomenal comedian and very smart woman and just in general. I and love said, her so much. Oh my, she makes me laugh. Like she makes me laugh like few do. Like, yeah. yes, she makes me like choke laugh. Like when yeah. you laugh so hard, you can't breathe. But she came up to me and said, I know a lot of people probably come up to you and talk about really heinous stuff. And I said all the time, every day <laughs> in my life, but I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> like I can handle it. Go on, tell me. And she said, I just don't think there's any way that that man, his name's Glenn Richter or something. She's like, I don't think there's any way that that's his first time that he did it. Mm, Although I, I looked, mean, I looked him up. He doesn't have a record in Dallas County, but that doesn't mean that it's not the first. He was a truck driver. So he theoretically uh, could have been crossing state lines and yep. doing similar things in other states. So I think that seems like a very heinous crime to be somebody's first crime. And it was it's like very almost rehearsed. Apparently, uh, there's conflicting reports that he was holding a puppy or somehow oh, co- trying to distract play her. to her emotional. Yeah, distract her and then held her at gunpoint and then, you know, made her. So it's, cl- you know, money motivated and violent motivated. But it seems sort of organized to the point that maybe it's not the first time. He thought it out at the very least. Yeah. But, it, I mean, kudos to the Dallas police officers. They found him in like three days. Yeah, I mean, it was great. quick. But that was in the first. Initially, that's a pretty Greenville Avenue is a pretty hot spot for, you know, hanging out and yeah. going to bars, Lots daytime, of bars, nighttime, restaurants, yes. all kinds, stores, all kinds of stuff over there. And so they but there's also a lot of condos, new build, nice condos that have ring doorbells and security cameras. Uh-huh. And they said, please, if you have any footage, it, you could be several blocks away. And th- that car driving by her car driving by that will help us yeah. like pin down a timeline like where they went. So I think nowadays we're. Hopefully, getting to the point. Yeah, where or I mean, over in UK, CCTV mm-hmm. is huge. Mm-hmm. We we have some here, but we need more. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, the eye in the sky can often help you, even though if you're not doing things you shouldn't be doing, right, then you don't over have here. anything to worry about. Well, back in California, life in the trailer park was going okay for Gordon. Sure, he and Lisa slept in the back of a truck covered by a camper top. But he did odd jobs to make ends meet. One day, a woman passing through the trailer park, Catherine Decker, had a conversation with Gordon where he cried to her, lamenting his lot in life and how unfair it was for little Lisa to live like this. At the time, Catherine's daughter was having trouble getting pregnant. And according to the account in Chase Darkness with me, Gordon got an idea. Gordon was looking for a temporary caretaker for Lisa while he went on an out-of-town trip. He'd only be gone about three weeks, he assured Catherine. So Catherine's daughter and her husband agreed to take Lisa in as a bit of a trial run. Initially, everything seemed to be going well. That is, until Gordon never came back. It was June of 1986 when little Lisa had begun life with her new family. But, wanting things to be on the up and up, the caretakers called police to report that after the initially agreed upon three weeks, Gordon had yet to return. I'm a lawyer and I can't tell you where the line is drawn between a long-term babysitter and abandonment. That's a good question. But I think... My, well, I guess if he had given a timeline of, and then yet, I'll be back in three weeks and he didn't show up, then that's when you start to question, uh, is this guy coming back? Is he not? This kid, what's the deal? We gotta have paperwork. Yeah, I mean, good for them for going to the authorities. That's but, nice that they were legit about it. They could have just lied. Yeah. The family offered to take Lisa in, but with no paperwork, the authorities had to put her in foster care. The police couldn't help but ask themselves, who was this man who abandoned his daughter? Who would just leave behind a child he loved? It wasn't until police did a physical examination that they discovered the upsetting truth. Gordon had been molesting Lisa. Horrifying, because... The worst, my worst nightmare. And this poor little girl... 
was having to sleep in the same mm-hmm. small truck with him. Uh, yeah. That's horrifying. Yeah. She doesn't even have her own space. She's five. Yes. That's I think about five. Yeah. You know enough to, or you're cognizant of what's yes. happening. You have no one to turn to to help. No. It's it literally makes my stomach like I want to throw up just thinking about yeah. something like that. And for her, like you said, being left behind is the best thing he could have done for her. Yes. Was to get himself away from her. Officers searched the trailer park and eventually found a fingerprint for Gordon on the inside of a VCR he had repaired for a fellow resident. When police ran the prints through their database, they came back with a match. But it wasn't for a man named Gordon Jensen. The prints had a match for a drunk driving suspect in Orange County from a year earlier named Curtis Mayo Kimball. The man with so many aliases, Curtis, Gordon, Terry, also had a lot of bad habits, and drunk driving was one of them. Two years after abandoning Lisa, he had been pulled over and arrested in L.A. for driving under the influence. Now, three years after he had taken off from that trailer park, police finally caught up with the man who had abused and abandoned that innocent child. I mean, so we've you're... got Terry. Done. We've got Gordon. Bob Evans. We've got Bob Evans. Now we've got Curtis Kimball. How do you keep track of who you are? I guess maybe I would Dude. say he goes by states, but maybe counties. I don't know. That's hard. You'd think at some point, you, hey, I'm Gordon. Wait, I thought you said your name was Curtis. Oh, um, uh, yeah, it is. Like, My bad. You've got to. Yes, it's going to yeah. get you're going to get confused at some point. Yeah. What a tangled web of lives to have to keep up with. I think about even people that like cheat or having affairs or have like other families in other states that's nuts to like me. how i can barely keep up with my own family it's how exhausting. am i gonna have, that sounds like so much work it's exhausting to have an affair yes. or have another family like just this amount of stress and anxiety you must constantly feel that you're going to be found out how can you even enjoy something it's true and i think i always think of the things that you you know like i i sleep talk and i sleep scream apparently sometimes i mean i know that but like i have night i'll scream myself awake sometimes and i had like i had a leg cramp the other day and i was screaming and it's just like the things that you could wouldn't you just accidentally say something you accidentally reveal i bet it happens i don't know i bet it happens yeah just ways that you know you don't think about like you know saying you know my grandmother used to go nancy jerry or like she would say all the names before she get to the one you know I oh it's like kate pedal ella yeah i'll go over to yeah yeah (laughs) Whatever. Whoever's to say. over there, stop it. Exactly. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I don't know how it. people keep stuff like that straight. And like you said, did nobody ask him for a driver's license ever? I guess he I mean, apparently had fake ones. Have you ever asked somebody you're dating to see their driver's license? <laughs> okay, don't tell Paris. <laughs> but on our first date, when he put his, he like put his license. Or he put I his, won't tell Paris. He put his de- <laughs> debit card down, and I was like, now I know your last name, so I at least could like look up his Facebook and make sure that he was like a legitimate person. Because everyone on Facebook is, <laughs> legit, is legitimate and truthful. Yes. But I've never asked anyone but I didn't ask to see their ID. ID. I mean, why would I? I probably have seen them because... You all should. Or, you know, you're at a bar, or somebody gets carded or whatever. But, like, I guess if you're not con- concerned or maybe you just don't want to know, all, ignorance is bliss, there's you're like a- just kind of like... Turning a blind eye. A bit between us lady lawyers that if anybody dates somebody, we all kind of go in to help Google them and just make sure that everything's on the up and up. And a friend of mine met a guy, really liked him, hit him off or hit it off with him. And when she went to like search him, he didn't exist. And everybody exists somewhere. On Google. On Google and like whatever. We have like tracker programs, like lawyer databases and stuff like that. He was nowhere. And she was like, oh my God. For those of you that are dating a lawyer, just know that we're psycho. All of your stuff has been looked up and they know a lot about you. Like complete. (laughs) Like we're just completely teetering on paranoia. Maybe maybe stepping over a line. Paranoia. Uh, Yeah, maybe like teetering into some privacy things. (laughs) Then I'm not revealing what lawyer this was. But then later on she mentioned, you know, you're not really anywhere online and he had to say oh well actually you know i go by my middle name my first name is this blah 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 and then they you know she figured it out but initially she thought oh my gosh is he giving me an alias that she's my she and i are co-paranoid friends we were there were our boyfriends were teasing us this weekend because we were saying that when we pull our car in the garage 
we put it back in reverse while the door goes down because you can use the reverse camera to make sure no Golden State Killer like person slides in the back door. Slides. Oh, I look door. and see if it, I don't think that's. I think that's being a female that lives alone. <laughs> it's quite a use for a backup camera. I don't have a backup camera, but I just look. And Tommy gets on me all the time. He's like, "Do not get out of the car mm-hmm. until that garage door is shut," mm-hmm. because there was this guy that pulled into his garage and he. The garage door was closing and he was getting out of his car and somebody had been waiting for him to come home and like crept in and held him up at gunpoint. No. Yeah. So don't get out of your car until the garage door has closed. And I can look in my rear view camera. I think that's smart. I think so. So sometimes it's good to be a little, little on edge. Well, police arrested Gordon Terry Curtis on charges of child abandonment and he went on to serve 18 months in jail. According to court documents, charges of sexual abuse against Gordon were dropped in exchange for him voluntarily giving up custody of Lisa. Then, in 1990, when released on parole, Gordon left town and no one heard from him again. Well, good. Nobody wants to hear from this piece of shit. And he manages to just get away. I have some hot takes on the charges on of sexual molestation being dropped against him. It's true. It's um, one of those cases where they for sure know they can for sure prove that he so abandoned her. So take his ass to court and prove it. But I'm saying they can for sure prove that he abandoned her. Right. As for the molestation, there's signs of it. And if she's not competent to testify, if she maybe clams up when she talks about it or it would be more upsetting for her to try to get her to testify – Aside from the doctor's reports, initial doctor's reports, and maybe she talked, I don't know the extent of the evidence, but when you're a prosecutor, your job is to say, what can I prove beyond a reasonable doubt? And if they couldn't prove that beyond a reasonable doubt, they may not have, they may have said, well, we can charge you with it, but we can't secure a conviction. I have some hot takes. (laughs) Please. (laughs) I'm I'm just saying, uh, molesting a kid is like... There is a, if there is a hell, mm-hmm. it is, there is a special hellish hell. Express lane. Right, right there for people that do that. Yes. And it's hard for me to wrap my head around anyone being able to walk away from that. Or having evidence of it and saying, well, yeah, we I mean, if they really. were willing to charge him with it, then they obviously had something. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he went to jail. Yes. But then he gets released on parole. Pretty, and he jumps from parole like immediately. Yeah, and then he just <laughs> leaves town. Yeah. So right. shockingly, this nomadic, no named person. Oh, just, who would have thought? He yes. doesn't check in with his PO. Well, Terry's life in the 1990s is a bit of a mystery. The man was a drifter, going from town to town, changing his name, and performing odd jobs. At the turn of the millennium, Terry began living in Northern California, now going by the name Larry Vanner. So now we up to five. Terry. Larry, Gordon, Curtis, Bob. Yeah, Terry, Larry, Gordon, Curtis, Bob. That's five. Larry managed to weasel his way into a relationship with a chemist, pottery artist, and free spirit named Yoon Soon Joon. Joon had originally hired Larry to fix her roof, but when something in the handyman attracted her to Larry, they began to date. Billy talks about it in his book that... She's at a cafe and she sort of casually mentions, man, I think my roof's, my, you know, roof is leaking. And the owner says, Oh, I know a guy. He kind of does odd jobs and he comes over and he describes it really well in the book of like, he's on the roof and she, he's kind of a creature at this point. He's sort of old and haggard and he's not attractive. He was never attractive. He always right. sort of looked like he just was startled awake by yeah. an alien. He probably. looks like he's got <gasps> a meth problem or yes. something. Yeah. Yes. And she's something she's told her friends. Oh, something about his blue eyes. They were just so sparkling and it just drew me in and we just started talking. We didn't stop talking. So I don't know. The heart wants what the heart wants. Had she Googled him, she, I guess there was no Google. Had she asked Jeeves? She could have Googled him. She could have asked Jeeves. And it wouldn't have mattered. It was the year 2000. That's true. Ter- there were a million names he was going That's by. That's true. Larry Vanner was a fake name. Yeah. So Googling or asking Jeeves doesn't always work. But if you ask Jeeves and he goes, oh, I don't know, that's a red flag. Maybe. Or she could have done it and been like, eh, maybe he's just on the internet. I think, like I said, people see what they want to see and they don't see what they don't want to see. I mean, I've been there. In an interview with NBC, June's cousin, Elaine Ramos, described the frightened feeling she first got when she met Larry. You and Soon brought him to a New Year's Eve party. I opened the door to him, and it was the first time in my life the hairs on the back of my hand raised up. A chill came over me. I couldn't even reach out my hand to shake his hand. He was the creepiest person ever. 
Have you ever met someone that gave you that feeling? That you know, yeah, yeah. Really? <laughs> it's not funny. Uh, we had a weird substitute teacher in like fifth grade mm. that just made there was a little quattro, like a little group of four of us that were like best friends. Your gut told you, and we just one thought. Right? Just, it was one of those where it's almost like a magnet, you know, when you put two opposite magnets together and it moves away. Like anytime he would, you know, try to like walk close to Mm -hmm. us, we would all kind of want to go the other way. And I know as a grown up and a lawyer, and it's a very dangerous game to be like, mislabel a person as a sexual predator pedophile. or pedophile but that doesn't mean that you yourself as a person of any age shouldn't listen to your gut no you should and say oh, i don't think we're gonna we don't want to like if you get a bad feeling about somebody run man there's a reason mm-hmm. Elaine don't Ross worry me. about being rude or in fifth grade you're like well he's my teacher no. that doesn't matter no Always defy authority. In fact, that's what people prey on. Exactly. They want you to think, oh, this person's an authority. They can't can't question this. I can't be rude. I can't. No. Rebel. 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 (laughs) I mean, seriously, don't feel like, I mean, rules are not more important than your safety. Hell no. Yeah. Trust your gut. Always. You you get that feeling when you kind of look at them and you're like, so this person's not looking at me to converse with me. They're like looking at me and scheming in their yeah. head that they're going to kill me or yeah. something, yeah. you know, or yeah. Well, according to Chase Darks me, June's friends also had a bad feeling about Larry from the start. One friend noticed his quote, skin was colorless and others were suspicious because Larry rarely gave the same story twice when explaining his background to some friends. He was a retired Colonel to others, a former store owner. The May December romance seemed odd. But because June seemed happy, her friends decided to leave it alone. Now, that's where you get tricky. Because you have a bad feeling, but you also see your friend is happy. And, I mean, we've both known people that maybe we thought, hey, I don't think that guy you're dating is for you. But do you say something and risk ruining your friendship, Mm -hmm. you know, or alienating them even further than maybe, like, they are? It's hard because it's you tricky. have one and you, you know, you can alienate yourself, even if you're someone's sister or cousin or right. mom, you know, so you tread that line between I love you and I support you. And he said he was a colonel to me and he told her he was a storm, yeah. which I guess the two are not mutually exclusive. Someone could retire. But if all these friends have red flags going yes. off there, it would just be, it'd be one thing if just one person didn't like him. But when you've got multiple people thinking this guy's bad news yeah and your your friend can't see it and multiple quotes and articles and stuff you know as we were reading about it people would say i got an icky feeling he Mm -hmm. seemed weird he i was confused as to why they were together someone's like he straight up looked like a drifter yeah (laughs) yeah he did no there was no quote that we could find from any of her friends that were like he was an all right guy he was a nice guy everyone was like he was a big creepy weirdo that you know hovered around and was like completely dirty and like disheveled looking and who knows what she was going through maybe she was lonely or you know she just Uh, wanted some companionship and was Willing to overlook some things, you know, there's no judgment. No, I mean, for on her, on her behalf, because you get blinded, you know, you do. You yeah, feel, I mean, I've been you blinded. Feel like you feel a connection with somebody that Mike Birbiglia talks about. You feel like when you meet a person that they have a, a, an invention that no one else, like they're an invention that no one else has discovered. And you're like, you're the, you're the greatest. How has no one else noticed this? This yeah. is amazing. So you and get everyone that, else is like, this invention has been out for years. It's called a bag of dog shit. Now there's a lot more, uh, <laughs> like uh, improvements that have been made to this. <laughs> yeah. The 2.0 version. But yeah, he, you know, he, she was blinded by the romance, blinded by the light, wrapped up like a douche. Oh, there. Isn't that the song? Wrapped up like a deuce. That's right. It's revved up like a deuce, actually. Wrapped up like a but deuce. wrapped up like a douche is a great parody. <laughs> you, should, you should wrap your douche up. Actually, you're not supposed Shh, to douche, are you? No. Douching. I've never douched. Please don't DM us. <laughs> I have never douched either, but from what I've read, douching is not the best for you because it flushes out like essential bacteria that you need up in mm-hmm. your hoo-ha mm-hmm. to make things run smoothly. But if you want to douche, we're not here to judge du- you. Douche away. You douche, douche all you night. Douche, douche all day. You, you do douche you. <laughs> Hashtag you do you. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of live and let live. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, back in New Hampshire in 2000, a state police trooper was following up on the two unidentified victims found in the barrels near Bear Brook State Park back in 1985. 
The bodies had been found 15 years earlier, but he was walking the scene, looking for any clues that might solve this barbaric mystery. The trooper walked the same trail the hunters had years before. He looked around the same area and horribly made the same gruesome discovery. One more barrel, two more bodies. One was wrapped in plastic. They were both young, toddlers, with one aged between one and three and the other between two to four. Like the other two, they had suffered blunt force trauma to the head. The backs of their skulls had been smashed in by what seemed to have been a brick. Can you imagine this poor guy is, no. okay, oh I'm going to investigate. I'm going to, I am imagining that there's no way, there's no way there's another barrel The last there. thing when you're investigating this is thinking you're going to come across the another same. barrel. You're thinking maybe I'll find some debris that was left behind or some bones from the first mm-hmm. one or, or something, but... I don't think that's what he was anticipating no, to find. No, that's... God. And then also just unbelievable. You just never... You could just never, ever even imagine that that would be what you would find. No. Man. By this time, DNA testing was available, and authorities wondered whether the newly discovered victims were related to the two found in 1985. Despite massive decomposition, tests were done, and it was revealed that, yes, three of the four victims, the adult female and two of the children were in fact related. But the fourth victim was unrelated, and none of that victim's DNA came up in any searches. While authorities now had one more piece in this heinous puzzle, the victims still remained unidentified. And that's a head scratcher for law enforcement because for sure. you, you think this woman and her children have been killed her you're three like, children. You're like how is a woman and four children three children. three yeah but oh yeah four total, right? Yeah four total people. Yes. Well, yeah. Okay. So a woman and three kids, two of the kids are related to the woman. Mm -hmm. How has this been not reported 15 years and no one's reported it that they're not that they're missing or yeah, that it wasn't on somebody's radar. That's yeah. And you're just thinking who, who can we test what? And because they're not going to be any kind of needle in a haystack. They're not going to be in a database. Yeah. Well, back in California. In 2001. So now we're back in sunny California. I'm you, this spans the decades and the, the continent. It spans a lifetime, it feels. It's a continent. Isn't it? Yeah, we're on a continent. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're on a continent. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> we're on a rock floating through the uh, just infinite space. The the black, inky expanse. It's eternal darkness. Nothing Third else out there. Third rock from the sun. But... John that, Lithgow. Also, underrated show. Such a good show. It was really good. Third John, Rock from the Sun. John Lithgow is man, so fantastic. He's... Him. Also, did you ever watch Dexter? I watched the first season of Dexter. Oh, season four with John Lithgow. Best season by a mile. Good to know. Dude, he is... Oh, it's so creepy. Well, so back in California, 2001, June and Larry decided to get married. Friends gathered in their backyard for a Star Trek-themed wedding. However, the union was not official. No paperwork was filed, but the two began introducing each other as husband and wife. Things seemed to go well for the couple until a few months later, when June uncharacteristically stood a friend up for lunch. Briefly on the Star Trek theme wedding. Yeah. I can't remember the joke, and I don't want to spoil the joke, but Billy's got a pretty good joke about this. Just that he makes like a Star Trek joke. Oh, a Star Trek joke? In the book, I Chase Darkness with Me. Do did never watch Star Trek. My dad was big into it but I, I never i never got into it i've seen key episodes of old star trek not i have seen those with like spock and stuff yes yeah back and in the then day. i dated a guy that was very into the next generation and i was just like there's no way i'm gonna watch this but caspers who i'm in an improv troupe mm-hmm. called watermelon caspers is one great. of my co-members is named caspers and he's from latvia and he got on this Star Trek Next Generation kick and just all of his bits were not only Star Trek bits, but then also in a Latvian accent. And it's so good. In, in the show? Yeah. And in all of our shows. He, all he does is Star Trek and bits. He would, come out, he would come out and just be Data like a lot. <laughs> it was so good. He would go, I'm a robot. I don't have feelings. Oh, <laughs> man. So good. But I never ever watched that. People are, it is, has a cult Oh, following. I don't. And I, you know, I actually have seen all the Star Trek movies with Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto. <laughs> Yowzers. You know, Ooh. Zoe Saldana, too. She's in that. Mm-hmm. But. I've seen some of those. Yes. So they get married. This is... A, uh, here's the thing. I'm a lawyer. I'll tell you. You can have whatever theme wedding you want. You just have to file it with the county or it's not a wedding. Right. It's not a thing. Now, if you do, at least in Texas, you can have common law after two years, right? If you refer to each other as husband and wife and you 
have bills together or share a home together. Your names are on the same mortgage and stuff like that. It is. um, There are several rules that you have to do. You do have to put yourself out as husband and wife. Right. So you have to, which is what they were doing. You have to live, you have to agree to be married and you have to live together as husband and wife. Holding yourselves out, that's kind of where people can argue if, argue that they didn't. So like, for instance, if you file your tax returns as not married filing separately, you file it as single. It's like, you're not holding yourself out to the IRS as being mm, married. But or, in other times you're like, no, this is my husband. So yeah. So then that's where you get these. You can't lit- pick and choose. Yeah. You get Just these. Just like in real marriage. Well, cause then what happens is someone goes, I don't like you anymore. I don't want to live with you. Well, you have to divorce me. Hell no, I don't. We're not married. Well, yeah, we are. We're common law married. It's like, uh-uh, I got these tax returns and I put on Facebook. Right. I was single and I, you know, so there's all these indicia of marriage. Just, just fucking file it, man. Don't, don't rely on common law. I agree. Well, June's friend was worried, but Larry assured her over the phone that June was just busy. Over the next few weeks, several friends tried to reach out to June, but were all rebuffed by Larry. He had isolated his new bride from most friends and family, and her remaining friends began to worry. For two full months, June's whereabouts were communicated to friends and family only through Larry. She was traveling. She was working. She was at a remote cabin making repairs. Then, finally, June's friend Rose was fed up and decided to call the police. Well, this is a problem back in the year 2001. Was there wasn't in like... the year 2000. Such a good bit. I love you because when I was typing my parts of the notes for you, I put in the year 2000 and I was like, I hope she appreciates that that's from Conan. <laughs> Such a good bit. It's... Conan O'Brien in oh, general. Oh, God. I love Conan O'Brien. Formative, formative comedy of my childhood. Yep, yep. God, the masturbating bear as a kid. Oh, I so thought that was so funny. So good. And it's the dumbest bit, but it's so good. It's so good. He man. revolutionized late night television. He really did. That's a man who just did whatever he was going to do. Yep. But and worked hard as fuck to do it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, in the year 2001, you didn't have like Instagram stories, Twitter, people checking in, play, you know, cause she could say, here's a picture of me in right. San Diego at a conference. Here's a picture of me in our cabin in the Smoky Mountains. It's. No, you could get away with a while for lying about somebody's yeah, whereabouts. Yeah, this guy, I mean, he really was pushing it. If, if Tommy didn't show up to work and his boss calls me and is like, where's Tommy? And I just, I'm like, He's at a cabin. I don't, I don't know. He's at a cabin. Don't ask any more questions. <laughs> After a few days, they're like, he's not. A, and then his best friend works there too. And they're like, uh, we haven't seen Tommy post anything. He's at a fucking cabin. I, I can't, I've been texting him. He's not replying. He doesn't even have a cabin. What is she talking? Like it would come down very quickly. They were probably mad. They're like, shit. you guys had a cabin this whole time? Yeah. Like, you fucking tell what us? are you talking about? You got a, ca- you got a vacation house? That's you never so, invited us so there. So mean. So that's what would happen is that's how our vacation house gets found out. That's right. That we've been keeping from everyone. Fucking Tommy wouldn't check in like he was supposed to. <laughs> but I think this guy just took advantage of, much like any of these killers, he's sadistic, he's a monster, he's terrible, but he's not some kind of genius. He just took advantage of a people's politeness because if you go hey where's june or where's june soon and he goes no she's out of town you fucking liar you know you go oh well can you have her call me oh i don't know she's really busy she's probably not coming out you know you're preying on her friend's yeah. politeness and you societal speak with authority and confidence you always act a little bit agitated and irritated and want to get off the phone yes and then like who's going to question they're that? not going to push eventually it. someone will but well, for a while they won't they got to get you know it took it takes this long and then also he's taking advantage of there's really no way to track people back then it wasn't right. really like we can ping her cell phone and figure out where she's at well police met larry at the house he shared with june he agreed to come to the station for questioning contra costa captain roxanne grunheind rode with larry downtown she told the concord monitor he had extremely twinkly bright blue eyes and at the time he was charming and talkative and very intelligent he was super smart he was very calculating larry chatted freely with police But according to Chase Darkness with me, Larry seemed evasive when talking about June and used past tense verbs. Well, that's a key sign. A little bit of a ding, ding, ding. Yeah. If you're going to be so smart to uh, evade her friends and family, maybe don't say, well, she was Mm -hmm. or she did or man, I really miss her. (laughs) I haven't seen her in a long. She was going to call. It's Yeah. He's giving himself away. Exactly. Another particularly bizarre moment caught Captain Grunheim off guard. 
When they were chatting freely, she asked about Larry's accent and where he grew up. She later told Billy Jensen that when asked that question, Larry's demeanor completely changed. He growled and told Captain Grunhein, That's none of your goddamn business. Grunhein said that Larry's demeanor switched from calm and normal to aggressive and back again. Like the flick of a switch. Because people can only hide their true colors for so long. And being pressured like that and pressed and something so simple. And he probably felt like, oh, she's about to start digging digging, and and she's trying to gaslight me here and get me to open up by pretending to be like interested in me or my friend. Or she's about to look into my background and run my prints. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because they're in California at this time. Where are you from? Well, shit. Now he's got five names that are about to pop up. He probably can't keep straight. Probably not. While Larry was being held at the station, Captain Grunhein and another officer went to the house he shared with June. They poked around and checked the garage, where June kept her pottery equipment in kiln. Through the garage was the door to the basement. And what they found at the bottom of the stairs was something neither expected. Standing before them, about two feet tall and five feet around, the officers found a pile of roughly 250 pounds of kitty litter. Nearby, they saw a small spray bottle filled with deodorizer. When the officer began to poke and prod at the pile, he unearthed a grisly discovery. A human foot. Buried underneath all that kitty litter was Yoon June. That's that is uh, grisly. not a sight you are expecting. No, and it's... You might be expecting to find her, but the kitty litter would throw a lot of confusion on the, on the situation. And it just shows, because here's my question. I don't have a cat. I've had a cat. How much does one box of kitty litter weigh? Um, They're heavy. Like 10 pounds? Probably. I mean, you can get it in different. But let's things, say but like, one box is ten pounds. That's twenty. It's, it's heavy. Kitty litter is heavy. He Anytime I had to go to the store to get it, it was a bitch. Hoisted twenty five pounds or two hundred fifty pounds. So twenty five boxes, let's say, of kitty litter down those stairs. That's just a fucking monster. Mm-hmm. That not only did you kill your wife, then. You put her body at the bottom of the stairs and left it like garbage and covered it like kitty with kitty litter like. Like cat, it was feces. Like it was cat refuse. Mm-hmm. Like that is disgusting. And you walked up and down those stairs. 25 arguably times. Arguably 25 times. Carrying that stuff. Feeling the weight of that in your arms. Knowing what you're Sweating. doing. And just thinking the whole time, I just got to get this done. And and the deodorizer next to it shows that he's like, gosh, it's starting to stink down there. I better. Oh, he's he's planning. It's he, all planned out. He's um, just disgusting. It was determined that June had died from a vicious wound, blunt force trauma to the back of her head. After murdering his wife, Larry had tossed her body in the garage and covered it with kitty litter to mask the smell of her decomposing body. Larry pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 to life, but Captain Grunhind was not satisfied that June was Larry's only victim. She matched his prints in the system and found he was the same man who abandoned little Lisa back in the trailer park all those years ago. When asked who Lisa was, Larry, Terry, Curtis, Gordon, Bob, whatever, smugly smiled and refused to give any details. That's just the last, the last remaining bit of control he has Mm -hmm. that he can exert. He can't take human lives anymore, but he can say, I've got something you want. He can withhold information. I'm not going to give it to you. Well, unfortunately, rather than live to face the heinous crimes he committed or assist investigators whatsoever in discovering his true identity or the actual number of murders he committed, Terry Peter Rasmussen died a coward in prison in 2010. But thanks to the hard work of investigators, detectives, and one lost little girl, the story doesn't end there. Little Lisa from the trailer park was now all grown up, a mother and a wife with a happy life living in California. However, she was curious about her past, now that she knew the identity of the man who left her in the trailer park. Fingerprints and DNA tests revealed that although Terry was the one that abandoned Lisa, he was not her biological father. That's got to be kind of a feeling of relief. Yeah, for sure. Lisa then tested her DNA further. With the help and encouragement of Detective Peter Headley, and through genealogy mapping with the help of renowned DNA expert Barbara Ray Venter, Lisa discovered that her mother was none other than Denise Bowden. 
and that little Lisa was actually Don Bowden, who had disappeared at just six months old with her mom from New Hampshire on Thanksgiving Day in 1981. Isn't that just mind-blowing? It really is. Barbara Ray Venter is the one that also helped with the Golden State Killer case with mapping the familial DNA maps. Oh, yeah. There's a whole long article, and we link it in the show notes, too, about uh, from for the Forensics Magazine about how she does it and how she maps it, and it's amazing. I it's mean, like art. She, it, she's a mixture between an artist, a scientist. Mm-hmm. It's puzzles. Like a, like you have to have a mind. Cryptography. I mean, just of another world. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And, and the time, you know, trying to go through and saying, okay, well, it's extrapolating. Like if you share this relative, then you sh- may share this relative, which then would link you to this. It's, I mean, it's the future. And Billy said that in our interview mm-hmm. too, that, that it's the future of solving these cold cases from way back Absolutely. when. Absolutely. Familial yeah. DNA databases like 23andMe, mm-hmm. Ancestry, GenMatch, Match, mm-hmm. all of those are the way that so many of these, not just unsolved murders, but sexual assaults mm-hmm. of rape kits that are just sitting on shelves in police departments. That's how all of this is going to get solved. Get solved. Absolutely. And for the Bowden family, I mean, not that ever finding out that your daughter was murdered or, you know, is a good result. But in this case, at least they get their granddaughter back, you know. And how crazy is it for Lisa? You're like, I am not who I thought I was. Yeah. My, your whole life is just upended. You just think, oh, my dad sucked and he abandoned me. And it's like, no, someone stole me and stole me from my mother who I maybe don't even remember at all. It's fascinating. It so, really is. And, so and then, then you, you wonder, like, well... How do I identify now? I mean, she was a mom, a wife, and mm-hmm. now has kids. And now you realize you're somebody you didn't even realize you were. And there's quotes, quotes from her where she said, don't worry about me. Just focus on yes, finding She's very other... humble and very gracious in yes. that she does not want the spotlight on her. She wants other victims to get the same, receive the same identity that she did. And De- Detective Peter Head- Headley was the one that kind of told her, you know, it's good that you find out you found out that he's not your dad, but we should work with this woman to see if maybe we could help other people. And I think yeah. that's for her. She could easily said, no, I'm good. I don't, you know, it's enough information for me just to know who left me. But now, you know, giving answers to the Bowden family. When looking into Lisa's background, investigators found she and her mother had gone missing incredibly close to the discovery of the site where the four bodies and barrels were later discovered. Denise and her daughter went missing in 1981 and the first set of two of the bodies were found in 1985. Investigators wanted to see if perhaps the adult female in the barrel was Lisa's biological mom, Denise Bowden. Detective Headley contacted the New Hampshire State Police to ask about a potential link. He told them that he had discovered the whereabouts of Don Bowden and wondered if their unidentified woman in the barrel could be Don's missing mother. Forensic analysis was completed on the bodies in the barrels, The woman was not Denise Bowden, but there was a hit. Bode Selmark Forensics tested the DNA of the third child, the one who was unrelated to the mother and the other two children, and discovered that child's biological father was none other than Terry Rasmussen. Wow. So then they connected him. He was obviously there. You have a person who's obviously, you know, clearly able to take a human life, able to abduct a child. Of course, if that's his kid in the barrel, it stands to reason. Right. I think, yeah, it's just... And he killed Yoon Soon Joon with the brick to the head. These victims have all been hit in the head. It's his M.O. Classic. Man, but you know they were like, this. it's going to be Dawn. Yeah, they thought... it's going to be Denise. It's going to be Denise. Yeah, they thought it would be her. And then you're happy that you've made some connection, but you're also like... We thought... Man, we really thought... I mean, you would have thought that was a slam dunk. But investigators wouldn't give up. They were determined to identify the mother and two daughters in the barrels. They used DNA databases, family tree mapping, and got help from an unlikely source, a librarian. Gotta love the librarians. Hell yeah, man. They're the ones out doing all the research, keeping us on the Dewey Decimal System. Love a good library. Oh, man, I do love a good library. Librarian Rebecca Heath saw a post on an Ancestry website message board in 2017 that would change everything. The post was 17 years old, posted in the year 2000, and was asking for more information on someone named Marlies McWaters and her daughter, Sarah. According to KTLA, Rebecca suggested that perhaps Marlies could have been one of the bodies found in Allenstown, New Hampshire. She made a post but didn't receive a response. 
It wasn't until she was listening to a podcast about the Bear Brook murders about a year later that Rebecca thought to check back with the Post. She messaged the original author, who told Rebecca that the only information they knew was that Marlise was last seen with a man named Terry Rasmussen. Heart stop. If you're Rebecca, right? Yeah, yeah. You're like, I just I really know solve something. I think I know who that is. Yes. Because, of course, you know, if the the poster, the original poster just says, oh, it was just this guy and just had no idea. And also just all of the things that have to come together for this mm-hmm. happen. She's looking at a post that's 17 years old. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, you know, if you want to believe in fate or some cosmic energy, like what made her look at a post that mm-hmm. was 17 years old? Yeah. Well, the name didn't mean much to the poster, but according to New Hampshire State Police Sergeant Matthew Kohler, Rebecca was well aware of Rasmussen's background. Although greatly degraded, the remains were once again tested, and with the help of genealogy expert Barbara Ray Venter, it was determined that the woman in the barrel was indeed Marley's Honeychurch McWaters, and the two unidentified girls were her daughters, Marie and Sarah. So from all those years ago in the 70s, yeah, pretty much the first family that, I mean, that Bob, Other than his family that he abandoned, abandoned that are still alive. Yes. Yeah. But that he, this is the first family that that, his, that we know of set of victims. Right. That after all those years, like you said, all the pieces that had to come together for this. And then in his book, Billy talks about Rhonda Randall, who was a blog writer, mm-hmm. much like Michelle McNamara that worked on this mm-hmm. case. So her, I mean, she was kept interest in this and kept it at the forefront of people's minds. Billy Jensen kept it, it in people's minds. her people. white whale. Yes, and kept, kept it in front. So it's all these citizen detectives, true crime writers, detective or Captain Grunheide. Just you know, regular people, like every, a librarian. A librarian, a police officer, mm-hmm. a, a blogger. A, you know, it's people... At average citizens who are interested in justice that won't give up. And what is so beautiful about that is that the family wasn't beating down their doors Mm-mm. and calling them, trying to find these people. Mm-mm. And that's not saying anything about the family. Maybe, maybe there were some reports filed. What I'm saying is, well, she took off driving and said, I don't ever want to yeah. see you again. So the family just assumed, well, but she doesn't kudos see to all of these people for saying, even though no one's looking for these people, mm-hmm. we are not going to let them have an unmarked watery grave. Mm-hmm. And even if no one's looking for the identity of these, and at this point they had buried the bodies in a local cemetery yeah. and they de- you know, donated the space and the headstones and stuff that it just said, you know, here lies a person. Now it's, oh, that's our family member. Yeah. You know, they can have a proper closure. It's amazing. Well, three of the four victims found in Allenstown, New Hampshire have now been identified, but the fourth remains a mystery. It is likely that all four victims from the Bear Brook State Park were killed before 1981, as Terry left the state after that. But who is the fourth little girl? All we know for sure is her father was Terry Rasmussen. Investigators believe she was born between 1975 and 1976 in California, Texas, or Arizona. Unfortunately, the identity of her mother remains a mystery. But based on the fate of his other mates, she may have been a victim of Terry Rasmussen as well. Investigators continue to search for clues that will help them identify the fourth little girl whose young life was violently taken from her. A tombstone in an Allenstown cemetery that was set up before the other victims were identified reads, Here lies the mortal remains known only to God of a woman aged 23 to 33 and a girl child ages 8 to 10. Their slain bodies were found on November 10, 1985 in Bear Brook State Park. May their souls find peace in God's loving care. It's just so nice that so many people... Came together. And and wanted to see justice and to Mm -hmm. see that these people's lives weren't in vain and they weren't just forgotten. And that state trooper sitting at his desk going through a file going, you know what? I think I'm going to go out there and take a look. Yeah. 15 years later. And can you imagine that? That that takes a lot of just dedication to a cause. Yeah. That's saying, I'm not going to just let this sit here and pile up all these cold cases. It really is something that keeps, you know, it itches in the back of your brain and keeps you up at night. People that work on cold cases are a, just like I said, (laughs) hell has a special area for pedophiles. Heaven has a special area for them yes because it is daunting and Mm -hmm. billy talks in his book how you can be working on a cold case and then you get 10 new cases that come in that you have to work those because the leads are current the leads are hot and it just keep the other one keeps getting colder and colder and it would be easy 
to be like, well, that was 15 years ago. No one's been calling about it. I don't know. I'm kind of tired. It's all right. But they don't do that. They want to see that justice is served. And don't give up. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. Good for them. Absolutely. So what do we think? Well, this one was uh, a a doozy as far as keeping all the threads. Yeah. Imagine how hard it was for him. Yes. Or his victims. God. I mean, we were, it was a lot for us to wrap our heads around. So... Imagine how Lisa slash Dawn, when she finds it out, mm-hmm. what that's like to put that all together. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like you said, at least she gets a little bit of closure in so far as knowing that that monster that did that to me wasn't really my dad. But then who really was your dad? Yeah. But hopefully maybe with DNA, you know, familial tree DNA, then maybe that'll help her find out who she is. But. Yeah. And she now has a relationship with her grandparents mm-hmm. that were still alive and stuff. So good came out of that for sure. Definitely. But yeah, this one was you know states and cities and names and all over the place and they still they still don't we really know what went on in the 90s and there's just a big these are just the victims that were found that were found i would posit that there are many that were not and especially given that nobody knew his name mm-hmm. what name he was operating he was under. a drifter he was a drifter he was in arizona and texas and I- iowa so like, much vast land where things can be dumped yep and so it just so happened that those hunters found the, the bodies in Bearbrook State Park. But there could be – Terry Rasmussen could have left victims yeah. all over the country just based on not – the authorities not knowing where he was for that stretch exactly. of time. So he's a, a fucker, as Billy Jensen he is, says. He's a fucker. <laughs> Sorry he to gets use, the golden juice award. Yeah, he's ju- just sadistic just to take advantage of children and kill children and take advantage of moms. And it's a, a doozy – it's a doozy. But I am glad we covered it because, like Billy Jensen said, this is like one of the worst serial killers that no one knows about. Yeah. And I think the more the true, he, you know, obviously the heroes, but the true story here is not about him as so much as, like I said, he's no genius. He was a shitty person who took advantage of people's kindness. He took advantage of the lack of technology. He took advantage of people's uh, uh discomfort with like you don't, I don't have to be a genius you just he yeah. had just a ton of rage yes he had a lot of rage and manipulation but the real heroes and there's a video uh and I, we linked it in the show notes that i would highly recommend you watching is when R- billy on true crime daily they t- which was a tv show he was on he took roxanne grunheide to meet the new hampshire detectives and the footage is on youtube mm. and that kind of kindred spirit that you, yeah. nobody else knows that feeling of we were hunting. all worked on this case together but, but not knowing that you were doing it exa- it's like yeah. we were both chasing a ghost it's we like going know. through the trenches together yeah, yeah you just didn't know you were chasing the same ghost yeah. so it's a really beautiful that is moment. an interesting and special bond that few can understand and, and they had the, the folks that were investigating the bearbrook cases had never met terry because he was dead yeah. by the time they figured out he was the one that did it so she's the only one that talked to them to talk to him yeah and so yeah. she can tell him them it's kind of like you build up this monster in your mind yeah and she's like he was like a drifter yeah. he was like kind of nice i guess but he was kind of charming but yeah at the end of the day it's just a man yeah you build yeah. up this and that's the just a shitty shitty man shitty shitty and that's the sad part of all of these things that we cover is that the horrible things we do to each other mm. well on that note <laughs> oh, what, what a happy note <laughs> what a happy note let us know what you guys think and like we said, this is covered very well in Billy's book and go out and read it. And yeah, check out those videos in the show notes. Yeah. There were some amazing moments that are, that they caught. That's uh, awesome. Between those investigators, the true heroes, the true heroes. Well, and on that note, that's yes, a that's, that's a note. happier note. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sinisterhood will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit SinisterHood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. 
It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your Patreon shout outs. Kylie Harris. Matt Skidmore. Kerrigan Thomason. Megan Ferguson. Ashley Olson. What if it's the Ashley Olson? <gasps> What's up, Ashley Mary Olson? Kate? You know what? You're the Ashley Olson oh, to us true. because you subscribed. Thanks. <laughs> Jessica Nitwich. Jesse Krantz. Noelle Myers. Pause. Noelle Myers and I used to work together and I told her these great stories about my dad because he would tell me to like not, he would tell me to be careful ostensibly in the kitchen. But then she and I had a bit that we would be like, don't put that knife in your mouth. Don't, hey, hey, don't walk in front of, don't walk in front of that bus. Cause my dad as a kid, I was big enough for him to not need to tell me those things, but he still did. So anyway, I just want to say, Noelle, don't put that knife in your mouth. Haley Walters. Susan Pyatt Baker. Brian Harrington. Yay! Babe, I love you. Stephanie Guyon. Amy Jarbo. Jamila Haynes. Elizabeth Whited. Thank Nicole. you, Elizabeth. We love you. Nicole Baker. Jessamine Oakley. Momby. Morgan. Aaron Glazer. Samantha. Casey Cassidy. Gina Johnson. Amber Burge. Amanda Powell. Abby Temple. Tabby B. Leah Moeller. Caitlin. Erica Weisdorfer. Kelly Harris. Mary Beth Griggs. Tammy Scott. Miranda Meyer. Sandy Haley. What's up, Sandy? Badass lady. And Danielle Stewart. Thank you all so much for subscribing to our Patreon. We really appreciate it, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Keep it creepy. Sinister.